Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> today is April 11th, 2020, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy, Philosophy Science Chat. Okay, so let's see who we have today here. So today we have uh, Bill Lucas, we have Ian Chapman, James Keen, Roger. Welcome everyone this morning. How's everyone doing? What's new? Hello. How are things going, Bill? Oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> it's a lot, lot of uh, staying at home these days. Yeah, a lot of staying at home. How, how is that affecting you? I, I mean, you're already retired, so it just means you're just not getting out at all? Well, uh, many of my friends are now unemployed. But uh, being retired, uh, so far, it hasn't affected my income. So that's a good sign. But uh, for the people who are still working, I think there are now 20 million Americans who lost their job, at least temporarily. And uh, they're wondering how they're going to pay their rent and pay for their food and all that kind of stuff. Because after a while, you max out your credit card. And, uh, so... And then it has to be paid, <laughs> or you pay Although a very high interest like rate. One, it's only been like one month, maybe a few weeks, right? Yeah. You see, people are supposed to like you know have a rainy day fund so they can you know uh, go with uh, income for maybe three to six months, you know. But well, apparently there's just a lot of people who are just hand to mouth here, right? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of people that eat hand to mouth every week. And they don't have they don't have any built up savings, and uh, I know uh, any built up savings. Yeah, <laughs> so that's not good. But yeah, we those of us who plan for the for problems like this, we can we can uh, do better. Uh, yeah, you'd be surprised. I used to work for the government. How many people retired at the earliest age and never put any any additional money in their retirement program? And they think they can just live on Social Security. And they can't do that. It's not enough money. So. That's right. Not enough money, not enough planning. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we have Ian here this morning. How are things going with you? Yes, I was going to ask Franklin. Um, there's a complete um, bar on persons over the age of 70 from leaving uh, their place of residence at all. Now, now, luckily, I haven't reached that age. So. Uh, I, I go out for walks and so on. I, I don't think I, I could survive without that. And in fact, I believe that fresh air and, um, you know, vitamin D and all the rest uh, are, are good for you. So I'm just wondering, do, do you guys have a similar requirement for, for, for old people over the age of 70? No, I haven't actually heard of that, where they try and lock in all the old people. I know that if you're in a retirement home, you're kind of like that. But there's no general uh, ban against older individuals uh, going outside their house. Here they're saying you can still go outside, but you have to stay six feet away. Uh, right. I, I think um, everybody has to stay within two kilometers of their place of residence. Um, yeah, I... I, th I think that's it. I think people over the age of 70 just must not leave their houses. Now, um, the Irish not being a very law-abiding race, I think have have, have not been always um, following th that to the letter. Um, it, actually, there's a, some media uh, information that over the Easter weekend, uh, people have been traveling to holiday homes. Have they been stopped by police and maybe turned back? Uh, so things like that are happening, but but certainly I, I think locking a person up completely in a house and not not letting him outside um, is 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 wrong. I I, I I would criticize that, but that seems to be the case here anyway. Well, I think that's what they were doing in Wuhan. Basically, uh, had some relatives, and they said they were okay, but basically they were locked into their houses and they had to. Uh, had everything delivered to them. I have no idea in a city of 11 million people how you get everything delivered to you, but apparently that's what they did. I think that's lifted now over there, is it? 
Yeah, I think they're starting to lift it. But how about something in science? Have you seen something in the emails that's caught your eye? Um, I, I, actually, I just wrote a letter, um, an email to um, Dennis Allen, because he, he wrote to me after um, one of our conferences, maybe a couple of weeks ago, about the mass increasing with velocity. And um, I replied to him pretty immediately, actually, but he didn't receive my email. I think it's because my old email address were tended to be spammed. Uh, so I've just sent him a, uh, my, my reply, which I sent him on the 29th of March. Uh, but that was something we discussed maybe about two or three weeks ago. Um, I don't know. I've been just looking at a, a few things, some esoteric things like... <laughs> uh, tensor expressions of Maxwell's equations and so on. I was just dabbling, dabbling uh, in that the other evening. Um, what was your, what was your uh, feeling on the mass increase issue? Right. Um, well, you may re recall, I'm not sure if it was only in the chat or if he actually said it as well, but Dennis said, uh, referred us to an article um, uh, where it, it seemed to be that the, the, the writer was contradicting himself. He, he was saying, look, uh, um, one of the, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the cyclotron experiments had, had, had shown this not to be the case, and yet that proves that Einstein's uh, mass uh, increase equation is quite correct. So he seemed to be contradicting himself, and... Um, I, I, I tried to establish that maybe this was a bit of double think or something, but looking in more detail uh, at the paper, and in fact, Dennis sent me an extract from his book, a big tome of, of maybe, I don't know, a couple of hundred pages that he wrote with some colleague. Um, but I, it wasn't totally germane to the subject as far as I could see. So I, I, I just conceded that um, I think the article was indeed contradictory. Um, and that the introduction of things like longitudinal mass and transverse mass, which vary ostensibly in different ways. I think I don't have the, the email in front of me now, but I think the longitudinal varies as the cube of the gamic factor or the inverse of the cube. And, and the, the other one, depending upon whether you take uh, Einstein or J J Jeff Amenko's um, uh, 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 theory, it either... Um, varies as, as 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 the square of the gamma factor or as the gamma factor itself. But anyway, it seems to me that you had to uh, posit that the force was composed of electric or magnetic components, or maybe both, to in order to postulate this longitudinal and transverse mass. So I basically conceded uh, that it seemed to be a contradiction in terms. The other thing, by the way, is when we were talking last time about um, um, uh, photon mass, uh, you know, I, I think I may have got it the wrong way around in something that I said. The, the um, you know, you can calculate a, a photon mass, if you like, by, by just um, dividing the, the energy H nu, if you like, from the, from the Planck equation by C squared to get an order of magnitude of an equivalent mass. And you get this small mass, you know, 10 to the minus, I don't know what it is, 19 grams or something. Now, um, however, if you theoretically postulate a zero rest mass of the photon, so M naught is zero, well then, uh, and you take the normal equation that if, if you assume that uh, M is equal to M naught over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared, well then, when V equals C, uh, the, the denominator becomes zero, but also the numerator becomes zero if you, if you postulate that M naught equals zero. So that's undefined, um, and, and therefore the equation doesn't blow up, because otherwise... Um, equals yeah. zero, right? If the rest mass is zero, but the, the mass of the photon when it's traveling at the speed of light is this small quantity, non-negligible quantity. Yeah, I've always personally, though, thought that that's an illegal operation myself. Yeah, well, well, perhaps it is. But, I mean, if you postulate a non-zero rest mass, um, 
and then you say, well, the thing has accelerated to the speed of light. Obviously, the equation blows up. So it's 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 illegitimate, certainly in that case. Okay, well, it kind of looks like my mom is calling me for some to take care of. I was wondering, uh, maybe Bill, you can uh, you can uh, take care of the conversation here for a few minutes, perhaps. Oh, I'll try that. <laughs> um, you were mentioning some uh, things by Dennis Allen, and uh, um, I was I don't know how familiar you all are, but uh, um, SpaceX and Boeing are working together to put up um, 3,000 low-level satellites for the new G5. And the um, in order to have a low-level satellite that doesn't fall to the surface of the Earth, you have to continuously accelerate it uh, to keep it from falling because of the, the um, uh, friction of the atmosphere takes away some of the energy of the, of the satellite. <clears throat> and uh, so they're using what's called inertial propulsion, which is a way of basically changing the mass of the uh, satellite and giving it uh, uh, propulsion. They use uh, the uh, something like a solar cell on the satellite to get the energy for the um, uh, inertial propulsion. And uh, according to uh, politically correct science, that's impossible. But people are investing millions of dollars to put these 3,000 satellites up and they've already got hundreds of them up and some parts of the united states have access to these low-level satellites but they're not all up and they will eventually have world coverage so um, what we see is that there's some uh, things now that uh, uh, classical science and uh, uh, the accepted science uh, doesn't agree with, but people are spending their money and it seems that the satellites are staying up in position. They've been putting them up now for about a year. And uh, so it looks like it, it is working, but it doesn't agree with any scientific uh, uh, theories that uh, you can get published in a mainframe journal. <laughs> and so uh, do you have any comments on that? I, I just didn't quite catch, um, I suppose, the punchline there, Bill, as to um, what the main contradiction between, I suppose, established science with regard to orbiting and, and centrifugal force and friction and all that and, and this experiment. I didn't quite get what the main contradiction is there. Well, um, this basic idea was first... Uh, 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 promoted by Eric Laithwaite. I don't know if you saw the uh, video of the Christmas lecture at Oxford uh, University uh, where he had a, a small child uh, and uh, he put them on a scale to weigh them. Then he handed them a large, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, kind of like gyroscope but it was a it was a it was a big heavy wheel on a long pole where the pole went through the middle axis of the wheel and the child could not pick that up it was way too heavy for that child particularly if they had to hold on to the end of the uh the rod which was like six feet long that went to the center of this big disc that was <clears throat> that could be rotated uh so he couldn't do that and they weighed the, the, the gyroscope when it wasn't turning, and it weighed more than the child. It weighed uh, over 50 pounds. Then uh, he spun the gyroscope up to high speed, and then he asked the child to pick it up from the end of this long rod with one hand and to bring it above his head. And he was standing on the scale and he did that, but you didn't see the weight of the gyroscope plus the weight 
of the child on the on the scale. Uh, in fact, it was just a pound or two more than the weight that he had when when there was no gyroscope there. And uh, so, for demonstrating that, which violated the laws of uh, uh, force of inertia uh, and uh, other laws that Newton had proposed, and of course this was in Great Britain uh, where Newton lived, and uh, uh, for doing that, he was fired from his academic position, all of his contracts to create the high-speed uh, electric railroad where the train kind of r rises above the track. Uh, and uh, that government contracts were all uh, canceled. The uh, Japanese bought the equipment and built the trains. There were, he'd already done about 20 miles worth of track at the time this had happened. But anyway, they, they bought that in Japan and they finished it and they have a high speed railroad now. And now China is doing it and they're bringing it uh, all the way from China into Europe. So they're going to make the, the old silk trading route. They're going to make it with this high speed railroad and the railroad uh, can go up to 400 miles per hour which means that it can deliver goods faster than an airplane and cheaper. And so the Japanese are, I mean, the Chinese are hoping to basically take charge and make a fortune <laughs> off of all this uh, stuff that they're transporting. So that's, but anyway, that's how that, that began. And then uh, people uh, found other ways to, uh, um, no, other things they could invent, like putting, using some of this technique in satellites. And uh, SpaceX is making the first spaceship. <coughs> They've already got the shell of it made. The first spaceship that will use inertial propulsion to take off from the surface of the Earth and go to the surface of the Moon and the surface of Mars and back. And that's supposed to happen in the next two years. So that's kind of what's going on in the background. And uh, uh, the question is... How Bill, can I ask a question? We... Sure. Um, the angle of the uh, rotated gy gyroscope that the child pick up, um, does, does the angle uh, uh, matter, let's say, the plane of rotation is horizontal to the earth, uh, let's say uh, orthogonal 90 degrees from the earth. Does that angle make a difference? I saw a video about, about this, so it just occurred to me to ask you if you happen to angle uh, with respect to, to the earth's surface uh, matters. Y yes, it does. And also you need to be rotating your your uh, body as you move the uh, the uh, uh, gyroscope around. So, yeah, there's a there's a definite. Uh, it's called inertial propulsion, basically. And so, what you're doing is you're using this force to bring the uh, uh, gyroscope up, the heavy gyroscope, and uh, it's. Without that force, you couldn't do it. Particularly, the child couldn't do it, and uh, and so uh, a lot of people have reproduced that experiment. And you can see it on YouTube. And everyone who has done the experiment successfully with their own equipment is shocked that it works because they don't understand how or why it works that way. And so. Um, that that is the uh, the the problem. However, some people will invest a lot of money. I mean, a billion dollars or more uh, to put up satellites uh, that use this technique to stay in position instead of falling. See, most of the satellites go up very high. And you have to have a satellite dish to get the signal. But a low level satellite like they're putting up, you don't require a satellite dish. In fact, Apple is putting in uh, a little gadget 
in their uh, cell phones, their new cell phones, that uh, will enable you to communicate directly with the satellites anywhere on the surface of the Earth. And it just, uh, you know, you don't even notice that there's a satellite dish there. It's just uh, that it works so well when it's a low level satellite. And but of course, if they fall to the Earth's surface, that's the end. You don't have any more uh, communication with that satellite. So uh, that's the uh, the question. How can they do that? And how can they take and make a spaceship that will go all the way to the moon and and to Mars without any kind of uh, rocket type propulsion? And that's so Space the plane of rotation that. uh, that's uh, most effective is is uh, perpendicular to it. If you happen um, to know, I don't know for the case of how exactly how they're doing it for the satellites, but uh, the when when uh, 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 Eric Lathwaite was using it with himself. Well, with the boy did, picking the gyroscope. Yeah. He had to make he had to hold the gyroscope horizontal and rotate his body. So the so the disc of so the, the gyroscope plane of rotation was, is horizontal. The, well, the the rotation, the 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 plane that he moves the long handle of the gyroscope on uh, that is horizontal. But the gyroscope, the disc, is perpendicular to that plane and going around it. Okay, all right. So, uh, so anyway, you've got okay. yeah, you do have a lot of uh, angles there, but it, and you've got the the force of gravity that you have to basically your inertial propulsion needs to be perpendicular, or not perpendicular, but uh, the opposite direction to the force of gravity. So you want it to be going straight up. You want the force inertial propulsion to go straight up. And uh, that's wh why it determines how you rotate the, the gyroscope and how you do the secondary rotation uh, in, a, in a circle. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's very interesting. And uh, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, the Japanese company that's paying for putting all these up in space is is putting them up and uh, paying for it to SpaceX, and but everybody's saying, "Well, how can that work?" But it seems to be working. I mean, uh, I think they have over 300 satellites in place already, and uh, and it's working. They would have fallen to the Earth if it wasn't working, and uh, so uh, that uh, is. Uh, how, how does that work? And there are patents on it, and I've read the patents, but you can't quite figure it out from the patent. <laughs> and uh, but they demonstrated it to the patent office, and the patent office has accepted it. So, um, so anyway, that that's uh, something that eventually, if <laughs> it looks like it's true. We need to be able to explain that from the different approaches that we are taking in science. And uh, so uh, I, all our alternative scientific theories are uh, at, at uh, great risk of being, uh, what do you say, disproven the same way the current politically correct theories are, uh, because we don't necessarily uh, Take this into account. We ignore the data. We don't. We don't reproduce the experiments. Uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, that's. Uh, and and the question is, how do we make progress in science when people do this sort of thing? It's kind of like when Galileo discovered that instead of the Earth being the center of the universe, the Sun was the center of our solar system, and uh, uh, people just didn't believe him. And uh, he was under house arrest for most of his life, and uh, so you you see, if we're for doing a, a false theory, <laughs> and, and uh, so you can see what what's going on, and it takes generations sometimes to get someone to accept it, and then to try and understand what is 
happen. But I, I have always been quite amazed at the um, way uh, Eric Lathway uh, seemed to have been treated. Um, you know, he, he was sort of sacked and he was uh, his career was ruined and all that uh, for something that maybe isn't really fundamentally uh, so at variance with uh, established Newtonian dynamics. I mean, I, I've seen some... Um, putative explanations where it just means looking at it in another way and bringing in some other factors. But basically, using the Newtonian approach, approach they, they have ostensibly tried to explain, uh, you know, the, these gyroscopic motions and so on. And, um, I, I mean, um, Eddington, for example, wasn't thrown out of England for <laughs> saying that, that Newton was wrong. Uh, in, in fact, it was welcomed at the time. Uh, so I think there might have been other sort of like political... Um, dimensions to it. Um, I, I had the um, uh, pleasure of, of traveling on that high-speed train, the maglev train from um, the airport to Shanghai uh, a number of years ago, and it was quite fascinating. I think it was 431 miles per hour, as you say. Um, Galileo, I, I suppose his concepts were rather much at variance with, um, you know, the established uh, theological or philosophical views at the time um, and um, things like relativity uh, uh, would be and in fact in our case questioning relativity is against political correctness but I, I, I fail to see how, how Eric Lathwaite's um, concepts could have been dealt with in such a hostile fashion as, as if they were threatening uh, somebody or something well I think it uh was uh, threatening uh, a lot of things like the air, the uh, airplane industry and uh, uh, I mean you realize if you can go it, ta it doesn't take very long to get on a train compared to getting on an airplane you know you don't have to go through all these checks and uh, all that kind of stuff and uh, you don't have to be at the airport at least an hour early before you can get on the plane and uh, uh and then you can get to, because you don't have to do all that waiting, both getting on and getting off of the, the plane, uh, on the train, you actually make the trip quicker than you do on a plane, even though the plane may go faster than 400 miles per hour, but you got all these delays. And so, um, uh, and the uh, planes have a much more uh, limitation in terms of how much, uh, uh, parcels and things they can carry how much uh, uh, the cargo and uh, compared to a plane so and planes require a huge amount of space <laughs> like we have some up in the Washington area and some of them are almost as big as the city <laughs> you know like Dulles International Airport and uh, we have uh, also Washington National Airport and uh, those uh, airports just take up an awful lot of space compared to the amount of space that the trains take up. And uh, so uh, uh, it's a, there, there's, there's probably a lot of uh, uh, em emphasis on uh, not allowing it in because it's going to affect industries and be a, a big change in, financially and in, uh, in the industries in the country. And so I think that's why you see some opposition and that sort of thing uh, to it. But in the case of Eric Lathwaite, they had accepted his trains before he gave these lectures showing the demonstration that Newton's laws did not work. Uh, the big gyroscope. And uh, so I think... Uh, that was the uh, the uh, the main problem was uh, they wanted to retain the British wanted to retain their place in the history of science uh, by having someone as important as Isaac Newton uh, in their culture and having you know been part of their scientific uh, uh, history and uh, so you don't like. Uh, to to have that done away with, and I think uh, 
countries like America and others have certain scientists that they like to promote too, <laughs> you know, like uh, Tesla and, uh, 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 well, uh, many others that uh, Einstein and stuff like that. And uh, so, so anyway, I think every uh, country that has had a significant history in science wants to retain some of that history. So all these things are, are going on and uh, um, it's hard. I think what will happen is if this uh, uh, low level satellites are successful, that's being put up by SpaceX and Boeing, uh, if they are successful and accomplish what they're planning to do with the G5, they're going to offer every person on the surface of the earth unlimited internet access, unlimited cell phone, unlimited TV for $7 a month. Well, everyone on the surface of the earth that has that right now will say, I'll take it. It's cheaper. <laughs> and, 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 and it's faster, 1,000 times faster than what we currently have. So they'll go for it. And then that, then people will start to accept that because after everyone has seen that it works personally you know um, they can't say oh it's false it, do it doesn't really work that way uh, so what what aspect of eric lathwaite's uh, work do you think is being used in the satellites the the part with the inertial pr propulsion you know when he has the big the big uh gyroscope which is just basically a long metal bar with uh oh, yeah they okay so they got there. gyroscopes and gyroscopes have been used in uh, spacecraft but mostly just for orientation purposes right but but spacex is using it to basically continuously accelerate the low level satellite to uh make it so that it can overcome the friction of the atmosphere these satellites are low enough that you can see them with your naked eye and uh, they are uh, uh, close enough to you. You don't need a satellite dish like the, the satellites that we have that use a satellite dish. They're put up very high so that they uh, will last a, a, a good length of time before they lose their uh, uh, inertia and fall to the surface of the earth. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but thousands of satellites have already fallen to the surface of the Earth. And it, most of the ones that, that Russia and we and other China and other groups have put up in space, uh, uh, they will eventually fall because they don't have any means to keep them up unless you send a rocket up and pick them up and move them to the orbit you want and release them again. And, uh, but we don't know, normally do that. I've got some comments from the uh, from uh, YouTube, and you know, Misery says uh, he's watched the Eric Lathwaite's gyro videos. He can explain all of those easily. Although I'm I'm not sure that I have have a, a satisfactory explanation for those things myself. Um, what do you think? Are those things are are those things explained? I mean, I think there's certainly people who've tried to explain it, or they've done. Other experiments, like they've taken that thing and they have put it on a scale, and when it lifts up the gyro, the, the heavy object, uh, the the weight that's still being registered is the same. In other words, that when they use the child, the child, let's say the child weighed thirty pounds, and when they uh, yeah, but they've done this uh, by you know they've replicated. I've seen like an experiment on YouTube where they replicated the experiment except they did it on a small scale and they put the whole apparatus on a scale, right? Uh -huh. And uh, what they show is that while the thing is operating and it's lifting, that the, that the physical weight of the entire system doesn't change, which is, I guess, what you would expect. Um, although that still doesn't really explain why is it, it takes so little force to put that thing over your head. So it's Lift something it like, yeah. <laughs> like the amount of force that's required from your hand is less, but yet that thing still weighs the 50 pounds 
that it always did. So it's something like that. I, I, you know, you can kind of explain that maybe is not a gravitational effect, maybe because it doesn't actually reduce the weight of the whole system in any way. But there's still something about, I don't know, maybe it's like leverage or something, right? I can lift like a 300 pound object with sufficiently large lever or a set of block and tackle, right? That could be another way of looking at it. Like with the block and tackle, I can easily lift with one hand 300 pounds, right? But I'm, I'm just thinking that something along those lines are happening. Well, why don't we ask uh, uh, who was that 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 uh, had that to say? How the name there? Why, why does he think? Yeah. Well, if you could comment why he thinks that those are explained, uh, I think that would be interesting. D does he think that they are totally explained uh, using Newtonian dynamics? I mean, um, you know, we understand very well the behavior of a spinning top and we can calculate precisely the precession and the mutation using using classical physics. And um, I mean, it seems at first glance quite surprising that a gyroscope can sort of balance on, on, on gimbals, you know, just on a particular point. But it's actually this, this, the spin and the precession which is, which is keeping it uh, above and, if you like, defying gravity. So all this is fairly, um, fairly standard. I, I'm wondering... Um, uh, does Musera agree, or, or does he think that um, you know we don't need anything more than classical uh, physics to explain uh, what uh, Lathwaite did? Yeah, I'm wondering whether by you know explanation he's actually just kind of uh, just denying the whole anti gravity thing, right? Because I think maybe Eric Lathwaite was kind of implying very strongly that he had uh, defied or reduced gravity in some way. And there are easily experiments to show that, that the force of gravity is not reduced under those experiments. But yet that might, you know, disprove the anti-gravity aspects of things and explain it at that level, but still doesn't explain why I can take a 50 pound barbell you know, and hold it on a, on a stick and, you know, wave it over my head <laughs> like he demonstrates. <laughs> that, that to me, still seems like a mystery. Now, I have heard some things, like I think Dennis Allen, he uh, he's, uh, works on these things like uh, inertial propulsion systems where, you know, it is of a very practical uh, use to be able to uh, provide some net force to boost your satellites up because normally that requires propellant and propellant is limited and is very expensive and uh, that's why people don't generally like to use that. And it looks like Dennis is on the phone right now. Let's see what you have. Hello, Dennis. Are you there? We were just talking about you. Did you hear us uh, talking about you? Yeah, he says there's a paper here. Yes, I know. Uh, there's a paper by Richard Waite, W-A-Y-T-E, a weight reduction in a spinning wheel. So does he actually, you know, claim or measure that actual reduction? Because like the experiments I saw show that the actual weight of the entire system doesn't change. Is that true or is that false? He thinks the weight changes. I, I can send you an email with uh, attached if you like. Okay, you could send that. I might because I haven't looked just looked into this too much myself. All right, so you can also comment. You don't have to call me up live, but that's interesting. We can do that. Okay, so I'm gonna hang up right now. All right, there we go. Can you show my? Uh a screen here so they can see the uh, this book on inertial propulsion. Yes, inertial propulsion, the quest for thrust from within. So who uh, published, who, who's the author on that book? 
This is uh, God, Gottfried, Gottfried Gucci. Gucci. Yeah. And he has a lot of patents. And these are some of the technologies that are being used in uh, by SpaceX and Boeing. And, uh, um, and the fact that they are getting uh, companies to spend uh, millions and maybe even a billion dollars or more uh, on uh, these satellites with inertial propulsion to keep them from falling to the surface of the Earth uh, indicates that somebody thinks it works. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and if all you have is electrical energy that's on the satellite because it's got a, the equivalent of a, uh, you know, a, 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 a crystal that gets energy from the sun and, uh, and, and uh, uses that energy to uh, provide the, uh, the electrical power inside the uh, satellite. Um, we, classical science cannot tell you how just spinning a wheel or something like that inside the satellite can make it go up higher above the surface of the Earth. And uh, so the, the question is, how, how do they accomplish that? And, uh, and people have seen it, and they believe it works. But they, I don't know if they understand it. This book I just showed was one uh, author that is publishing things trying to explain it. But when I read it, I don't understand it either. <laughs> so I I have seen the pictures, the videos, and and I think they're real. I don't think they're they're uh, uh, you know a, a magician's trick or something like that. But uh, 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 you have to be able to e explain that. And uh, so uh, what I've been doing is uh, if. In my work, if the uh, electromagnetic force is the universal force, then there ought to be some way to show from the uh, universal electromagnetic force law how this uh, how this happens. In other words, how does uh, uh, it uh, uh, actually uh, uh, work in terms of equations and forces that you can write down? And that's what uh, I would like to see. So it seems I found some website here about uh, some guy doing an inertial engine here. So this would kind of be an example of that. You just have something which is pushing itself along yeah. by just spinning stuff. But <laughs> it would be nice if it would just rise above the surface. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the 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 big gyroscope does when uh, Eric Lathwaite turns it around and, and uh, you know and, and is able to to pick it up. Yeah, so that's that's an example there. I guess you've got something that looks like a washing machine going on crazy there. <laughs> It's just like when you're walking, when your washing machine starts walking uh, across the across the kitchen floor when you turn it on. Uh, you can see the weight is changing as it moves because like, the weight on the other end of the uh, lever it gets lighter uh, there. Yeah. But these are all fascinating little experiments, I suppose. Demonstrating the, the principle or how this would look like. Of course, uh, when, when you're dealing with uh, something that's touching the ground, I always uh, be skeptical that you're that you're taking advantage of friction, and that usually use an asymmetric friction to get the 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 net direction and force rather than uh, something that might be usable in in space. You haven't turned on the uh you guys can see the video right yeah we can see it so why don't you get to turn this thing on okay let's see here you, you can make it a little bigger by you know opening it up yeah there we go so. 
because basically, you know, I can do that by scooting myself on my chair, right? Uh, <laughs> well, also, on these things that people put on the internet, you don't know what they've got inside, you know, in inside of the uh, get, the thing that they're that's moving. You don't know all the details and everything, so it's hard to uh, to say that's valid. But what about simple things like uh, kids on a swing? And uh, that that's non-trivial. You know, I've tried to teach my kids how to uh, propel themselves on a swing. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and, but yet there, it would seem that, you know, you're just swinging your legs. But yes, you're, uh, you're able to get a pretty large uh, acceleration. Is that a, a, a case of inertial propulsion? Looks like Dennis is back here. <laughs> yes, Dennis. Uh, you got another comment? Uh, uh, weight, uh, the uh, weight reduction in your moving wheel by weight is uh, in your inbox. Okay. Well, maybe you can take a look at that then. Uh, here well let's go back and see what other <coughs> fun videos they have um there they have a boat uh, so i guess they actually have a, a scale underneath the the device at this point And as it's jumping up and down, it uh, seems to be reducing its weight. Of course, if I jumped up and down on a scale, that would probably reduce its weight as well, I suppose. But uh, that's some interesting uh, applications here. And they have built certain little inertial engines here. But do they work in space? That's what they really need to do. They need to test these things uh, in space or in the vomit comet or some other low gravity, uh, non, no touch kind of situation, I think. See, I, I, I accept all this, and it's interesting, but I, I can't help thinking that with regard to the uh, Eric Laithwaite business that, um, you know, I, I think he um, had maybe a, a, a character which a lot of uh, 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 us dissidents have um, in that he, he, he didn't go along with the mainstream. He was sort of... Um, trying to indicate that <clears throat> what they'd been doing all along was wrong and here was a new phenomenon. And that really, by human nature, not justifying it, but by human nature, that put the establishment against him. Whereas somebody like Eddington, <clears throat> or we were discussing Hubble, I think, last time. I mean, Hubble was, was raising some very revolutionary um, matters, but he went along with the mainstream. And, and even when the mainstream misinterpreted what he was saying, he didn't contradict them. And he sort of indicated, oh, this is an evolution, as, as, as Eddington did. So I, I suppose I'm bringing in, apart from the science, I'm bringing in some human psychological factors, which, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do take Bill's point about the economic factors, obviously. There's industry, <clears throat> which feels threatened. But, but I'm, I'm bringing in another factor, a human, a human psychological factor, which reacts against a certain type of... Um, exposition you know it says that oh newton is wrong or something like that whereas if you say well newton is is right he was one of the greatest scientists ever but um here are some slight modifications we, we, we could introduce which we've learned over the last 300 years you know the former will not be accepted uh, and the latter the latter perhaps maybe okay so i'm looking at this inertial engine e4 
which is saying that it can pull a load equal to its weight and that uh, I, I think you should see what it is. It also said something about it being able to be appropriate for use in space. But uh, that's interesting. I'm not, I haven't seen such sophisticated devices uh, the, uh, proposed for inertial propulsion before. But uh, that's what a quick look at uh, at the internet reveals about inertial propulsion here. Did did uh, you get uh, Dennis Allen's uh, email? with the video in it? Uh, probably. I'd have to go take a look and see what's in my email these days. For those who haven't seen the the experiment that uh, uh, Eric Lathwaite did, uh, demonstration, uh, it makes quite an impact on you compared to some of these others that we've seen, which are, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't see all the details inside. There could be friction and stuff like that that's causing the, the motion. And because uh, you're on a track or something like that, you're just going forward and backwards. Uh, but to go up in the air, uh, that is uh, uh, something opposing gravity uh, that you can see and you feel like you understand because you, you can't see how a person could do that if it there wasn't some kind of inertial propulsion in other words uh, i if i try to pick up that that big uh uh gyroscope uh with one hand i can't pick it up when it's not spinning i'm not strong enough but when it's spinning i can do it easily so that when you see that you you realize uh there's something going on there uh that that uh, don't fully understand and so that's why you uh, give some credibility. Question that you. I might raise, uh, if I may. Uh, in it seems like in all of these cases, some energy has to be uh, injected to, for example, uh, the gyroscope that the child picks up with one hand. The injected energy. Uh, the energy required to get the wheel to start to spin in the first place, okay? And then in That's the right. videos that we just saw, it seems going to the device. So energy is being injected there, uh, apparently, um, uh, to, to make something spin in the device. So uh, I guess not really answering a question, but adding another question, what role is this injected energy playing in the whole scheme? Well, I think that's obviously adding, uh, providing the energy to actually provide the motion. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, a, a lot of easier ways to get something uh, to move forward. You just put a motor on and a wheel, and that's obviously a much easier way of doing it. It might have been a little bit more interesting if they had, I don't know, used a battery so they don't have to have an umbilical cord, but I don't think the umbilical cord itself uh, you know, takes away from the main point, which is that from, from just injecting electrical energy, you can get something to move, I guess, is, is, the, per, is the point. That just using electrical energy, uh, you can get a net force, because that's the hard thing to do normally uh since every action has opposite reaction normally anything that you can do within a box will not actually change its trajectory uh over a long term i guess okay I to, to follow up on what frank franklin just, just said it would seem that any motor should show this effect you're you're you know including a fan uh so um you're injecting energy to make something spin, and and does its weight then change when when the thing is spinning compared to when uh, uh, this energy is not injected and the motor is not spinning? I don't know. Maybe maybe this. Well, I think that's that's the whole 
problem here in that when you actually measure the weight, it doesn't change. There, there's something else going on here. That's why I, I keep on thinking there must be some leverage thing. Because if I put a 50 pound weight on a wedge on a lever and I do it with, and I, and I can easily lift you know, the 50 pound weight uh, with the assistance of the, the lever, right? But there's, but the problem is, is that in these things that there's, there's no solid support, you know, holding up the, the, the barbell like it would if I just put it on a, a wedge. But I, I'm thinking that there, that that there is may actually be something like that because the, the gyroscope can do some, the simplest gyroscope. You you, you can stick it on its edge. And it and it will spin around the point, the pivot point, and it doesn't fall down, right? So there is something that's acting just as the pivot point there, uh, but uh, there isn't. But I think it kind of acts that way. That that's kind of, you know, I haven't thought about it that much, but that's just kind of the way I think about it. Is that uh, when you're when you're Putting, you're putting the uh, weight over your head that somehow there is oh, some kind of leverage going on. Looks like Dennis has something else to say here. Dennis, what's going on? Yeah, Richard, wait, we got your uh, paper here. Now there's quite a delay there between you and me. So let's see if we can get that up here. So let's see here. So there's the, the, the paper here by Richard Waite here. <clears throat> It's saying an investigation has been conducted into the controversial phenomenon of weight reduction of spinning wheels. When subjected to forced precession and controlled lifting, a spinning wheel does indeed lose 8% of its weight as measured by a load cell. That is, some of the gravitational potential of the energy acquired during lifting is supplied by the horizontal input force causing an enhanced precession. Consequently, the averaged vertical lifting force is less than mg. The explanation for this phenomenon follows directly from the requirement of energy conservation throughout the process. So he's claiming an 8% reduction in weight, which, which is interesting. Now, when the wheel is spinning, when, when the wheel is spin, spinning, is this done in a vacuum? Anything spinning no, uh, like that could be moving there. Well, I don't know in this experiment, but uh, certainly when the little boy lifts the 50 pound uh, 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 barbell over his head, he's certainly not in a vacuum. And I'm thinking that 8% is just not enough right, okay. to I, I, the, uh, <laughs> account for what we see with people lifting weights. I mean, 8% is significant, but that's not going to let me weigh, it. you know, that's going to turn like a 50 pound barbell into like maybe a 45 pound barbell, which is still way more than I can lift, right? You're thinking, James, that so with regard to the 8%, uh, if you get it, what, you know, what is the air movement that might be taking place? Well, I would say almost none because, you know, a, a spinning, you know, barbell disc just doesn't interact with the atmosphere that much. It's not like it's a propeller or anything. I would say the interaction is practically zero. That's what I would think. I would think the uh, interaction between uh, the air and the moving disc is effectively zero. Now, if, it, if you were dealing with like a propeller shaped thing or something that has uh, obvious a lot of uh, interaction with the air, then maybe that might be, but it's definitely not anything like that going on here. So I'm kind of wondering what his, uh, what his experimental, 
we have something about uh, it looks like it's swinging pendulum kind of thing here. A lot of math, a lot of math, a lot of math. Okay, so there, there is this setup though. So there's you got the big spinning wheel, you've got the motor. And he's got load cell in handle here. So he did not measuring the total net weight, I don't think. He's just measuring the force on the handle point, it looks like. At least it looks that way. But uh, as scientists, you know, we uh, like I look at these experiments and try and see what he was saying in there here. So he's saying it's evident that the applied horizontal work input is converted into gravitational potential energy, resulting in a weight reduction of 8% typically. Although I would kind of interpret that as, yeah, if you are putting uh, work input, turning that thing around, then uh, I don't think that that's reducing your gravitational potential energy. You're actually, you may actually be putting energy to lift it up, perhaps, if that's what he was finding there. So I don't know that, uh, plus it doesn't look like he's weighing the entire apparatus at all times. He's just weighing the forces on the pivot point, which mysteriously does definitely seem to be less, but I think any implication that uh, gravity has been reduced or affected in this situation I would be skeptical of. But I guess that would just be my opinion, right? One way to look at it might be <coughs> if we go back to the SpaceX thing, um, presumably to design these satellites that don't fall, uh, given their, their altitude, presumably has an idea of what the gravitational uh, uh, the the great gradient in in the gravitational field is at that altitude. Okay, um, so one must also then be able to design the gyroscope uh, with the proper dimensions, uh, velocity of rotation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to exactly uh, or fairly closely match or oppose that gradient in the gra gravitational potential at that altitude. So in other words, uh, the SpaceX engineers seem to, to, to have the math pr pretty much worked out if they have designed these satellites, which don't, uh, which apparently don't fall uh, at that altitude uh, be because of this gy gyroscopic effect. So we may not have the math, but but apparently they have it. Okay. okay. Maybe it's in the patents. I think Jim Martin he was bringing up this other this other uh, method for propulsion, which is uh, basically ionic. I think. And these are the like the lifter experiments here. So these are these big uh, aluminum <laughs> devices here, and when you charge them up, uh, they they actually levitate. So like that, right? So, and this is a, a clear uh, levitation type activity. Uh, now there 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 is some wind that occurs out of these devices so you might think that you know it's it's like a propeller but when you see this thing actually rise off the ground 
you know, that's, that's quite rapid and quite dramatic. And, uh, you know, you don't feel like you're, you know, the, the amount of wind that's being created doesn't seem to account for that kind of acceleration. Would be my comment on, on these things. Have you guys seen these lifters before? I've never seen this particular one. No, you've not seen this? It's a fairly simple um, concept where you've got the, if you have a thin aluminum uh, fin pointing downwards and this just above that is just a charged wire. So you, create, so you create, and you put the charge across the thin wire and the aluminum sheet. So you create this, it's this very high electrical gradient from the thin little wire to the large aluminum fin. And then that causes, uh, uh, at the very least, an airflow. And uh, like your, your ionic uh, air cleaners work on that same principle, that if you sit in front of your ionic air cleaner, you know, you'll, you'll feel it blow a, a gentle waft of air towards you. And that's not because there's a fan in it, but it's actually driving the ions in the air forward so much so that it actually is creating a wind. But uh, these uh, lifters come off the ground so you know violently that it's kind of hard to believe that it would be just due to that. So now me personally, I'm thinking that it's actually, this may actually be a case where it is actually using the say the ether that if there's these unknown particles that that we don't recognize yet if we could use those for thrust um you know then we could get effects like this so i'm thinking while it does create some wind power i don't think that that is the main source of uh, these lifters uh power although they they these things, though, unfortunately, don't work in very well in a vacuum, I think. Uh, the, the amount of force these things generate in vacuum is uh, you know, practically zero. I, I'm not sure whether they have measured it completely as zero. I think they still get something, but it's pretty close to zero. So that would be unfortunate that even if this is an effect, the effect is not very significant in the vacuum of space, so it's not terribly useful for for that application. Otherwise, I think that you know, um, for low Earth orbiting satellites, that would be another thing they could possibly use in order to boost themselves with just elect using electrical power. We have some other comments here. It says the energy that helps lift lift the gyro has to be put into the gyro while speeding up the gyro. Well, there's definitely energy going into lifting up the gyro. I don't know that that goes into speeding up the gyro though. That would be kind of a, a conservation of momentum argument, I think. I don't know we have anything in the comments here about uh, explaining exactly how that whole thing actually happens. The whole uh, lifting the gyros up. <clears throat> but if they're able to keep all these satellites up in, up in a low earth altitude and not have them just constantly fall out of the sky, well, then they must be doing something, right? Because it's either they're using a lot of fuel uh, or they're using something else because definitely any satellite at low Earth orbit will have a tendency to fall down. So Dennis, you can't join us on the actual conference here? <laughs> no. Uh, I just read you a copy of my book. I explained boost gear mechanics. It's in your inbox. Okay. Alrighty, let's see here. Uh, 
So Dennis has sent me something else here in my inbox. Uh, also, have you guys seen there's a new show? Uh, they've redone Cosmos with uh, Neil Tyson DeGrasse as the, as the host. Have you guys seen that show? I've seen some of the earlier ones. Well, they've redone it. Now it's not Carl, not not Carl Sagan, but uh, although I'm kind of wondering uh, about the one one of the issues that uh, they brought up there. So they were talking about the double slit experiment, right? And I think they had, you know, given a fairly good explanation of that and how contradictory it is. But I was wondering what you guys thought of this. So they were explaining the double slit experiment as what is mysterious is that if you are watching uh, which light goes through which slot, then that acts as a particle. And at the, at the target screen, you'll see it just produces two nice little stripes uh, behind the slits, right? So if you're watching, then it acts like a particle. But if you're not watching, then what you see form on the on the screen is a interference pattern. <clears throat> so, and that's the big contradiction here. He said that you know you're not going to like this, right? It's just like how how light acts depends on whether you're watching it or not, right? And that's a big, gigantic contradiction. And he said that that was the biggest unexplained thing in all of physics. You know, why, why does that happen, right? So what do you guys think of that double split experiment? I mean, do things change depending on whether you're watching them? In particular, if you're watching a photon, uh, does it, will it either act like a, a particle or act like a wave depending on whether you're not whether you're looking at it or not well what is watching um is this um bombarding that photon with other photons or with electrons and they're thereby interfering with the circumstance well you see uh, with with your your popular program here cosmos they don't explain that what they do have is they have a beautiful graphic of these photons, which kind of look like little squids flying down, down a path, and there's two slots, and you can see the the little squid go through the slot, and uh, so they know they never explain that. All they do is explain <coughs> that if we're watching, then the photons go through the screen straight, and they don't and they produce these uh, two stripes right behind the slot versus if you don't watch and he did he, and he not watched by just like not looking at the uh, the, the beautiful computer graphic he produced uh, and then it caused a uh, interference pattern to arise which is the wave interpretation right now, i'm just going to point out this is kind of the problem of the you know popular how science is depicted in, in popular media, right? We we don't really get a chance to even know what that is, right? But I was kind of wondering, has, have, have any of you looked into this with any detail? Like like Bill, have you looked at this, this double slit experiment in any detail and well, come up with any conclusions yeah, of your own? Yes, and... Uh, uh... If you look at it just from <clears throat> the point of view of electrodynamics, the um, wave <clears throat> is not, the photon is not um, a very tiny entity. It has uh, some extensions. And when it goes through the slit, those extensions are interacting with the different parts of the slits. And uh, that's what causes the interference that you see. And uh, if you are observing it to see when each photon is going by, you're interfering with the photon and that makes it act differently. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> but they don't 
show you the interference and what it does to the photon so that it causes it to not uh, produce the uh, pattern that you're expecting. And uh, uh, yeah, that goes back to, you know, Ian's concern. It's like, what does it mean that what do you have to do in order to tell which photon a slot uh, a photon goes through, right? I think the most obvious explanation is that obviously whatever mechanism you're using to detect which slot it goes through, that's actually changing the nature of the photon, right? It's not like we can do on his video where all he has to do to not tell is just, you know, look away, right? <laughs> no, you can't do that. Uh, in fact, I don't think we have the technology to actually do that. Um, because when I've looked at this, and I've looked at this in some detail, the first shocking thing I find is that this experiment done with photons has never been done. Not ever, right? So we have all of these quantum physicists puzzling about, you know, how can this happen? How, how can it, how can when we're watching it acts like particles? And when we're not watching, it acts like waves. Actually, this experiment, as near as I can tell in my research, has never, ever been done with photons. It's a very difficult experiment. You know, first of all, you have to be able to well, have... Well, you know, this is sort of a commentary on, on the poor quality of this TV show. It's not surprising by uh, that it would have some such a poor quality um, in terms of its intellectual content, uh, given the hosts that you 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 are notorious for being poor quality from A to Z. Well, I don't know that it's poor quality in terms of what mainstream actually believes or what or what they're trying to sell, basically. I mean, that's basically true, I think that the uh, double slit experiment is at the core of quantum mechanics. Uh, but I think it goes to the poor quality of what people consider science at, at all. I mean, if it's true that they've never actually performed this experiment where they can tell which photon is going through which slot and then seeing that it produces, you know, uh, particle, expected particle reaction. I mean, that, it just borders on fraud, right? To claim that. To claim that that's the experiment that was done and that is the results that you get. If that experiment's never been done, that is just out and out fraud, I think. Well, hey, all you would need to do is cover one of the slots. Co cover slot. Look at what you get on the screen. Cover slot B see what you get on the screen, and then don't cover either slot. Well, we know what we get when we do that. If you cover Not one of the slots, two. then you just see the particles. That's You only see one bright band, right? You cover the other slot, you only see one bright band. If you uncover both slots and don't look, then you see interference pattern, right? You see bright band, light band, light band, dark band because we're thinking that the wave fronts are interfering with each other and they're creating the dark, alternating dark and light bands, right? But if you don't look, then it acts just like the, if either one of the slots were covered. Just like Dennis has a comment here. Des Dennis. <laughs> Theory of objects. Okay, let me let me just bring up uh, one reference here for the double slit experiment here. I think it will explain, or you know, that basically this experiment has never actually been performed. Well, we have the double slit slit experiment. So over here on the right, you see this is an interference pattern like that, and I'm not sure that this particular article 
explain the controversy about uh, between uh, between it being a wave or a particle. Well, well, you know, with both slits, with both slits open, not covered, you, each slit acts as a separate source, and so therefore you have the interference. With one of the slits covered, you don't have the interference. There's only one source, the other slit. I don't see really what the mystery here is. Well, it seems the like mystery, the, mystery stuff. Is, the mystery is not that it creates interference patterns. The, the, the mystery is, is if you can theoretically tell which photon goes through which slot, you get a, you, the, the, the interference pattern disappears. That's the mystery, that if you can tell which photon- Well, it's not a mystery, and, and uh, unless you know what the method is. We're not talking about magic here. There must be, an, you know, as, as one of the other speakers, I think it was Ian said, what is the means to determine that the photon went through to get this mysterious effect? If you can't explain that, it's then a thought experiment only. Yeah, and exactly. It's, real data. Uh, got this it, it's a thought, thought experiment. So if, 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 if you can't tell me how it is you're going to quote unquote know uh, which slit the, the, uh, the photon went through, um, you know, an experiment, and, and frankly, who has time for that? In other words, you're, you're physicists do creating a mystery. You know, there is where. What is the mystery? Well, it, it's great stuff for the popularization of science that you talked about the the program with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I, I some popular accounts that say um, it's not even if you look away and you're you're not looking at the experiment, but if you say. Um, uh, if you, I, I'm, I intend to look at it this time. Well, then the photons know that you intend to look at it, and they will behave accordingly. So I've seen uh, accounts like that in 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 popular science, and I'm just wondering what the basis of those accounts is. It it might be just fantasy thought experiments, fantasy. Well, that's what I'm saying. It is in fact just well, thought experiments. It, it is completely fantasy. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and it, it's uh, to follow up on what Ian just said. It, it's going back to the uh, what is it? The the um, Earth centric view. It's the universe revolves around us. If we look at something, or we don't look at something, uh, the sun re re revolves around the Earth. We're at the center of everything. As a matter of fact, the universe doesn't care whether we're looking at it or not. Now they have actually done this experiment in like the 1970s, but they used electrons. Now I could believe that you could do this experiment with electrons, since uh, we those those are definitely a, a tangible particle, and probably you could detect which slot it goes through by its interaction uh, with uh, its 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 charge interaction. I would think that that would be something you could do. So, but when they perform this, it's it, 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 you know what is the exact experimental setup, and what is the control condition? Experimentation in science involves condition A compared to condition B. Unless you can tell us what exactly those conditions are, and gather the data and show there's a statistical difference, you're not talking about science. I don't know what it is you're talking about, but it ain't science. Well, this would be in science. This would be science because they did actually do an experiment, but they did it with electrons. So you could go and see exactly Well, how is that detected? What is your experimental group? How is that detected? Which slit the electron went through? Uh, da, 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 da. They have done this with 
And they have these quantum eraser principles here as well. Let's see here. Uh, the, 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 the sending particles through double slits apparatus one at a time. Interf the variation interference of individual particles. So let's see here. They have some specific references here. Experiment on electron interference, American Journal of Physics. Here, let me share this again here so you can see. Um, but definitely there's some hard science here. Well, so how, how the thing, um, how you detect which slit uh, the electron is going through is crucial to the whole question, you know, and, and it's just not enough to say, uh, I mean, yes, you can say, but we really can't carry this discussion further until we know what that hard science was. What did they do? What is the experimental well, setup? Let's find out here. Corpuscles and uh, new scientists. I wonder if we can actually go to that. Because they're saying that you can see this phenomenon uh, with very, very large molecules like buckyballs, which are ginormous, right? So let's see here. So if you. If you're you trying to share um, something, right here, we're not seeing anything at the moment. Oh, you're not seeing anything? Let's see here. Did I, did I stop sharing? I thought I. Okay, let's see. Let's share the entire screen here. Okay. So here's an article here. So this is like the experimental setup. So you place the detector far behind the slits and a single electron will produce a characteristic interference pattern. A wave has seemingly passed through both slits at once. So they're saying that you can get an interference pattern with an electron, even though that's a particle. And if you place the separate detectors close enough behind the slits and only one registers a click as if the electron were a single particle. So this just depends on how far away from the detector you're putting this. Well, even I wouldn't be terribly surprised if that's the case, if the detector is sufficiently close. You're not gonna see interference pattern because it's not not even close enough to produce an interference pattern. So I don't think anything particularly mystery about mysterious about that. But even given that, so I don't think I think it's probably still unfair to say that we can't talk about this unless we know what the detection method is. I think we just presume that there is a detection <coughs> method, and that if they turn on the detection method, uh, they get you know, a particle behavior, which is no interference. And when they turn on the detection method. Maybe the, uh, Fra Franklin, maybe the detection method is, uh, is shown on the right hand side of the screen. Oh, you took it away. What you just had up there. Yeah. On the right side, may, maybe that's their detection method. You just put your screen right up by the slit. On the left figure, you're just shooting a bunch of electrons, and basically the slit acts as independent sources. If this were water, you'd, you'd get the same in interference pa patterns in, in water. You know, you, you make a wave here uh, at the source on the left side of this figure. The wave would go through and form uh, uh, two sources of disturbance. And, uh, you know, like there, there's nothing mysterious, uh, uh, quantum uh, magical about any of this that I can see. I think for this specific experiment, that might be true. Okay. That's kind of the, the, the problematic nature of how they describe things, because the, they'll, they'll describe things just like, you know, on the Cosmos show. 
and they they don't really explain that. But then you can go dig down really deep, and you you can find hard science, and you can find the electrons, the the electron experiment. And when I looked at it, uh, the the phenomenon did kind of appear to happen, I guess that uh, if, if you were able to determine which slit the electron went through, then it would behave as a particle. And if, we, and if you didn't detect which one was, was it whether going through, then it would behave as a wave. And there are so many experiments that reasonable And of course, are, are, are the that diagram happens. you show, this Cosmos show basically is Quantum propaganda. Science there in this from from what we've covered so so far, no no science whatsoever. <clears throat> it's just propaganda show. They want to create the idea that there's some kind of mysterious quantum thing going on, which is contrary to our everyday experience. Propaganda. This is the story that they want to tell. And uh, we we work with it. We understand it. And you dumb people out there, you know about it. Propaganda. That's all. All it is. Well, that's propaganda to build uh, up uh, the investigators uh, uh, producing the propaganda, and then they get their grants funded and so on. But isn't that because science? Because you said something mysterious, which isn't mysterious at all. Well, in this case, I think they're making the mystery up in their own mind. They're like proposing a thought experiment and then going, yeah, that's right. Really weird. And it's like, it's a thought experiment, guy. It, it may, you haven't even proven it happens, right? You kind of just thought that if if the quantum world is, is weird in this way, then it would do that, right? Except that no one's ever actually shown that to happen with photons. Now, they actually have to have it to show it's happened with electrons, okay. So even that's still weird, that an electron can act like a wave. I mean, I think they've clearly shown that. In the double slit experiment, uh, what's weird is that you can shoot electrons one at a time, basically. And uh, and I think that's how they do that. You can, you can definitely shoot electrons one at a time. So they send one electron at the, at the double slits and in behind the detector screen, you can see it actually is producing interference patterns. So I think, as I recall, that is definitely one of the experiments they did there. So there you don't have to tell, you know, which slit it goes through. You just know that you sent one at a time, right? So it can only go through one slot at a time. But even though it's going through only one slot at a time, and it's only a slot, so there's no detector, uh, it produces an interference pattern. So... So that's kind of weird. Although I would I would claim that what you're seeing there is the interaction of the electron as it bounces off the edge of the of the slot, because that's kind of like uh, bouncing a basketball through the hallway into an open gym, and it's like you know most of the basketballs are going to just bounce straight into the gym. They're going to go straight, but a certain percentage of them are going to hit on the edge of the wall between your hallway and your in, in your gym. And when it does, it's going to be deflected off in some other direction, right? It's going to, because it's hit that edge. And uh, so it's not going to go, you know, straight, at least to my thinking. And uh, in, in my hypothetical world, uh, space is quantized so that it's like Lego brick world so that you can only, you can't go in any arbitrary direction. There, uh, you, you are kind of limited to uh, a graph grid, so it can only go this way, or it can only go that way, it can only go that So the angles would be quantized. And if, if that's the case, then you would see an interference pattern build up, not because the electrons are interfering. If you see a bright spot in the pattern, it's because there are just simply more electrons going in that direction, and then there's less electrons going in another direction and then there's more electrons going in that direction because the angles is somehow quantized. So that way you can get an interference pattern, 
but it's not actually interference. It's just, you know, more electrons going in one spot than the other. But, but as I recall, I think that is the one experiment that I saw that if you send a single electrons down the pike and they go through uh, double sluts, that you still get something that looks like an interference pattern. But, but surely, Franklin, if that were the explanation, um, it would work with, with a single slit. If you shot a single electron through a single sh slit and the phenomenon that you've described occurred, well, then you would get an interference pattern. And I, I understand that that isn't the case. Well, no, actually, that's true. There is a thing called single slit interference. <laughs> and that actually even happens with light. If you send light through a single slit, uh, you will see an interference pattern. <laughs> And I think I think there they obviously think it has to do, and the interference pattern you you see depends on uh, on the width of the on the thickness of the slit and the width of the slit and the frequency of the light you're using. So uh, it's interesting that you do mention we get single slit interference interference because actually we do observe that as well. I think that's basically diffraction, isn't it? And um, the the. No, I think the fraction is a separation of wavelengths uh, by frequency, I think, right? I, I think Jim Jim says the interference is is, uh, is due to diffraction, I think, yes. <clears throat> well, then we have things like diffraction grading. So what exactly was diffraction? Diffraction. What is we mean by diffraction? <clears throat> and what is uh, let's see here? Diffraction is a phenomenon that occurs when a wave encounters an obstacle or a slit. Is defined as the bending of waves around corners of an obstacle or through an ap aperture into a region of geometrical shadow. Okay, so that clarifies things. So the diffraction is, the, is that bending of the wave around corners, right? So I think that makes things a little bit clearer. Now, uh, do we, have here, we do have Cornelius who's watching, and you know, he's got some comments on why that, why that happens. Uh, certainly, that experiment is one in favor of the idea that even particles are waves, right? So you can kind of explain this <coughs> if you think a particle is actually a wave, and so then, therefore, it actually has a a, a wave front, and it, it's basically impossible to send a uh, an electron through only one slit or the other because so once again we can't really tell what's going on at the slits because we don't have a microscope good enough to see that all we can do is observe to see what we see at the uh, at the detector screen that's really all you can really tell And we got some comments from Jim here. So uh, why don't I add Jim to the uh, conference here so he can talk here. So Jim, looks like you had some comments about uh, what we've been talking about here. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you, I can hear you. Okay. What do you think is going on here? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm a supporter of Peter Beckman's uh, gravitational ether. And he shows how um, Electrons are actually particles, and uh, as they travel th within a gravitational field, they uh, self-induce electromagnetic uh, waves around them. And that uh, these electromagnetic waves uh, go through the slit, slits, I should say, uh, as the particle is going through the slit. And uh, then they the electromagnetic waves can interfere with each other with the from the two slits and generate um, 
regions of higher and lower uh, amplitude. Well, uh, not if they're going through one at a time, right? Just if a second. Going, if they're going that, through that one guides time. the that guides the electrons to fall into the channels that look like that, that look like interference of particles. <clears throat> so even with one slit. Excuse me. One electron at a time. There's still these uh, pilot waves, essentially, it's very similar to um, De Broglie uh, Bohm pilot wave theories that um, guide the electrons. It's not. This is just no magic. And the light is purely a wave, so you can easily explain all these double slit experiments for light as a wave. And the photon nature, the particle nature of light is just that they're emitted from atoms as pulses. And those, pulses, say, behave, a, uh, those pulses seem to behave like a particle in some cases because they're absorbed by receiving atoms uh, as at the resonant frequency of the frequencies of the um, uh, of the atom shells, so light is just a wave, and that's where the well, confusion. Say there, that, there, is no, that. there is no duality. <laughs> what I would like to actually like to see is is them show uh, light uh, behaving as a particle, as in the double slit experiment where it only produces the two the two lit up stripes right behind the slit. Now that's the one experiment they've never actually been able to do, right? But that's the weird thing that they're claiming. That's why they're claiming that say a light particle if because it's that way, there's no, if you just read it away there's no problem. If you try to if you try to um, believe that light is a is a particle then then you get all sorts of problems and and paradoxes. Well, I would say so. That's why I'm kind of bringing this up. It's like, they're like bringing up a thought experiment that uh, that they're confused about because they just thought the wrong thing, right? Because they're trying to interpret the uh, light as photons, particles. <clears throat> yeah, if they're trying to interpret light as a... Uh, Some kind of magical... They're trying to interpret light as, as, as a particle. So much so that uh, they're fooling themselves into thinking what would happen in this experiment, right? Exactly. Now, the other thing that they brought up in the same show was this deal about quantum entanglement. Now, what's being very strongly implied here is that you have, you take a single particle and you split it up and that for all eternity, now these two particles are entangled, right? And that basically, if you if you uh, what if you looked at the one particle here, then it would immediately talk to its other particle there. And what's strongly implied, although I don't think they actually said this, is that if you change the state of one particle, like you know, one state, well, like my hand is open-handed, then immediately it would transmit across the universe, and it would change the state of the other entangled particle. <clears throat> What's being implied here is that you know the state of these two things are <clears throat> will follow each other. So if I close this one, then the other entangled particle will do that as well, and it would transmit its state instantaneously across the entire universe like that, right? It, this, uh, like I said, I don't think they actually say that, but well, this actually <clears throat> is a hoax. This entanglement is a hoax because they're they're saying that, for example, up and down spin. I have a whole paper on this, on up and down up spin. And it turns spin. out that there's only one spin. There isn't up and down spin. You can take uh, a beam uh, and split it uh, in a homo uh, in a homogenic field into so-called up and down uh spin uh, par uh charge particles okay how you can then one of those beams that's supposedly up and down and split it again 
In other words, the up and down spin is not a particle pro property. In my paper on up and down spin, it's a time phase property, okay? And so that the quantum number of spin up or down is really, really a fantasy. It's really time phase that is there be, because the very fact that you could take a beam which is supposedly all up or all down spin electrons or charge or, or other charged particles and then split it again is tell, telling you that the uh, uh, this is not a property. And uh, I have a whole paper which explains every aspect of the, uh, and it's the time phase. And of course, in binary mechanics, time is quantized. So the phase with respect to time tells you whether, tells uh, you, uh, 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 this whole entanglement thing is, is a hoax. Well, I guy wrote a book on this, <laughs> and I replied on Twitter to his announcement of, of his book, and he and and he was very very upset uh, because he has no explanation for this. It's it, it's a complete hoax. This entanglement thing. Well, uh, what part? What part of it is the hoax? I mean, I've explained that uh, there's this idea that <clears throat> transmit across the universe instantaneously, right? Now, to me, that's the hoax. That these things talk to each other. That's the hoax. Right. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, you're saying that the if, hoax if if there yeah. are no up and down particles. Uh, uh, there is no uh, action at a distance, as it were. Well, I could believe that you could separate a beam into two particles. Now, I'm not exactly, I'm not even sure how they managed to detect what the state, the spin state is of a particular particle, right? I'm not even sure how they do that. <clears throat> Other than put it through another stern Gerlach uh, analyzer, I suppose. But uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not too skeptical about the ability to split something into two recognizable things. I suppose, right? Uh, I'm. I'm more skeptical about well, this. So but the the. Uh there, there, when the uh, beam of charged particles is split. Uh, it, 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 it particles up and down. Okay, they're split because of the time phase with respect to passing through the magnetic field. Okay, and so the idea then that you would have. I don't understand. Uh, why, why do you mean like time phase? What does time have to do with this? Well, <laughs> you're going to be de uh, deflected in one direction or another, depending upon the time phase. Uh, there's a whole pay paper. I, I can't, perhaps uh, on an another week, I could prepare a slideshow. I mean, it, it takes a little bit of explain explaining. Uh, yeah, but, but this whole... You see in the literature about intent is is complete nonsense. It depends upon well, having up and down type type of particles. Well, there aren't <clears throat> up and down. There's only one spin. The electron do doesn't have spin A and then spin B. It only has one spin. All uh, all electrons. I don't think that they can detect. Uh, you know. Because you can, like I said, you can take another set of particles and you can run them through the stern gear lock and you can detect whether you got the A or B if you put it in the same direction as it was originally created. So see, this is the way I think stern gear lock works 
is that you're not, it doesn't have anything to do with time phase. It just has to do with the geometric uh, orientation of the dipole. Because first of all, they're not using individual electrons in these experiments. They're using silver ions, okay? Silver ions, a gigantic collection of protons and electrons and whatnot. <clears throat> and it has a dipole moment, right? It's got a positive side and it's got a negative side. You put that through, you put that through an, uh, a magnetic field and then the, 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 the dipoles, depending on, you know, which one is pointing a little bit more closer than the other one, you know, half of them will go this way, half of them will go the other way. They'll separate and they make two spots, right? Basically just do the magnetic uh, property. So, you know, while some of them will be oriented this way then, and then the other ones will be oriented this way, right? They'll be just the two orientations. What they mean by up and down is actually, I think, just a, a geometric orientation of space. So that's why I feel that if you put it through another stern gehrlich analyzer, like you take all your, say, you know, up, uh, up electrons, well, and you, you put it you through take, another take the there's silver ion beam. Sorting thing again, and then they're going to go into another two groups, right? Because it's a, it's a, a geometric, uh, <clears throat> geometric thing in, in, in my thinking. Well, you see, here, here's your problem. You you want to ascribe a property uh, of, uh, of the two beams, your, your, your beam A of the silver ions and your beam B or your up and down beams, if, uh, however you want to name them. But you could take uh, either one of these beams and split it again. Yeah, you can so because it's if geometric. Four of the silver ions only you couldn't split it again, could could you? But it's uh, yes, you can. Of it's property of, of the two silver ion. So when you're saying that they might have this orientation or that orientation as far as the dipole moment of the ion, oh oh okay, that that's possible. But like, yeah, uh, if you take the uh, the let's call it the up of all the same or uh, similar orientations and split it again. Obviously, it's not only a property of the silver ions. And, and I have a whole paper on this. And you see, like if you read a standard quantum physics book, uh, they're, they're, they, let's go back to just the electron now as our charged particle, or even the proton as a charged par particle, that there are really, really two kinds, up and down. Well, in my derivation of Planck's constant, which is the spin of the electron, it only gives one sign. Different signs, up and down, or, you know, spin this way or spin that way of the electron, well, and I'll also, the by the way, of the proton. So you cannot explain the splitting in the stern gehr gerlach type of experiment mm -hmm. based upon the fact that there are two, kind, two different spins, in, uh, you know, uh, for the proton, the electron, uh, there has to be something else, and it, and it has happens to be time phase. Okay. And, no, and I think to I explain, think that, maybe, maybe I should prepare a slideshow for you for the next week or or whatever. See, now this is the or problem that, that just like the double slit experiment, the the spin up and down stern gehrlach experiment hasn't been performed with say individual electrons. Right, there's no way you can send a single beam of electrons and have them split into the up and down thing. It can only be done with dipole ions, silver ion, dipole silver ions. It can only be done with those things. That's why I say that that spin is not an inherent property of an electron. It's an inherent property of a whole. Okay, dipole well here ion. you're doing a literature review. Uh, if, if what you're saying that this has never been done with an individual particle like a proton, or just a pro proton, a hydrogen ion, in, in other words, um, or a single electrons in, in in a beam, that's just a matter of the li the, the literature review. I mean, if, if you're stating that this has never been done, uh, it it bolsters my case. I, I I'd want to cite that. I, there must be a re review article somewhere that presents this, I'd want to cite that as support 
for my findings that there's only one sign of the spin of the proton and the electron, and it happens to be a positive quantum number, which gives you uh, a positive value for Planck's constant. Well, I would go a little bit further. I would say that electrons don't have spin. I would go so far as to say that, that spin is not a property of electrons. I would go that far. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's just an absurdity. Although I just wanted to leave you, we're towards the end of our conference here, but I just want to share with you my solution for what's going on <clears throat> with quantum entanglement. And certainly I think what the fraud is, is any, I, is any notion that the two particles communicate to each other. So if my hand changes state like this, my entangled hand will do that. If I do this, it'll do that. That is a complete fraud to indicate that there's any kind of communication going on between the two entangled particles, okay? So, but what's really happening is like my left and my right hand. But let's say I put my hands together and then I separate them into a left and a right hand. So what I can do is I could put my hand in a box and send it to Boston. And then I could look at the hand that's in Boston and say, that's a right hand. And then know immediately that my hand is still in Seattle, that's a left hand, right? So did my right hand and my left hand have to communicate in order to do that, right? I mean, that's, that's a non-trivial thing that I can send one of my hands to Boston and then that's the just at the hand that's in Boston, I can tell what the hand in Seattle is, right? That's because the state of, of, the, of your hand was set at the time they are separated, right? As soon as you know what one is, you know what the other one is, just because it's like a left and right hand glove, right? So there's no communication. And what most certainly you can't do is you can't look at my hand in Boston, see that it's a right hand, and then turn it into a left hand. And then see that the hand in Seattle has gone from a left hand to a right hand, right? That would be communication, but that is not what is claimed and that is not what is happening. It's just that you, you take these, these pair of particles, you split them into a left and a right, you look at one and then yes, you can tell what the other one is immediately, right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a mystery. <laughs> well, it, it's used in two contexts, I think. It's used in that context and you've, you've explained it, I think, fairly well. But it's also used um, in the context of maybe interaction, say gravitational interaction or electrostatic interaction between particles. And, um, you know, this established science is based on the principle that, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, including, say, gravitational interaction. And therefore, they introduce quantum entanglement to explain that. But actually, there is an interaction which perhaps travels at something like 10 to the power of eight times the speed of light, but they, they cannot accept that. Well, that would be another completely different uh, discussion. Someone did bring up, you know, the speed of gravity being instantaneous. <clears throat> uh, and there are a bunch of arguments about that. But since we're that, that, that will be another discussion for another day since we have uh, reached the end of our time here. So I'll just summarize a little bit of what we are talking about here. So we started uh, talking uh, a little bit about Eric Lightweight's uh, experiment showing that, you know, you can take a very heavy weight and lift it over your head. And Bill was saying that they have used that kind of technology in order to create this inertial propulsion systems where you can, uh, without using any fuel, just use electricity, you can exert a net force on your spacecraft in order to keep that spacecraft in orbit. And uh, we did a little Googling on that and we found a website uh, showing actually someone who built several several of these inertial propulsion devices and showing them kind of like scooting their way across the table there or, or, lose, or apparently losing weight when they're jumping around. And I think there's some reason to be skeptical about those things, um, but that's kind of where the discussion went. Uh, then we did discuss a little bit about uh, the new show Cosmos uh, and, you know, some of the, the mysteries that were presented in that show 
especially the ones about the double slit experiment where, you know, depending on whether you're looking or not, the, the result of the experiment changes, right? Which I think is absurd. I don't think nature cares if we're looking. It would just be a fundamental intuition about how we think physics ought to work. And I think we pointed out that uh, that whole photon double slit experiment, that is still just a thought experiment, never actually been done, right? And, but we did explain, uh, try to explore a little bit about why things which are clearly particles like electrons seem to have interference patterns as well through these slits, right? So that experiment has been done. Electrons, double slits, interference pattern, uh, that's been definitely been done, but I still don't see why you no know, people think it's such a gigantic mystery, such that you know Neil Tyson deGrasse you know, points it out as the biggest mystery in quantum physics. About you know why is it that things change when you're not looking at them, right? And then we also discussed a little bit about uh, quantum entanglement. Is it just a bunch of hooey? And I would say no, it's not. I mean, definitely. If you uh, split up two pairs of particles and you look at one of them, you automatically know what the other one is. But that's no mystery at all, right? Because that's the only thing it could be, right? If, the, if, you're, if your state can either be of A or B, if you have A, then you know you've got B, right? That's not a mystery. So. But it is strongly implied that these two things are communicating, right? And that is the complete fraud, I think. So, but that will do it for uh, this week's episode of the science chat. And uh, if you guys have any specific topics you would like to bring up, please email them to me or just come to the show and uh, we'll, we'll talk about them, right? Otherwise you'll probably end up just hearing me blab about my own theories and who wants to, who wants to do that? So do come with some uh, topic ideas and uh, we'll see you next week. And thanks for everyone for watching this on uh, YouTube and Facebook or on the recording.